In this video, we will review some of the basic mathematics behind extinction, which means absorption or scattering, of radiation in the atmosphere. We will see various forms of Schwarzschild's equation, which describes how radiance changes through a layer of the atmosphere. We will also cover the concepts of direct transmissivity and optical depth. Let's return to our idealized atmosphere from a couple of modules prior. The radiance observed at the satellite is whatever comes from the surface plus the sources along the path to the satellite caused by emission and scattering minus the sinks caused by absorption and scattering. Suppose you're interested in the change in radiance, or DL, at any point that we will call X, which in this case we have put in the cloud. The change in radiance is a function of location and the direction of the path toward the satellite, R. A, B, C, and D simply represent sources and sinks of radiation. In its most simplistic form, this is Schwarzschild's equation. However, A, B, C, and D by themselves aren't particularly informative. We will expand on this a little bit using the second equation shown here. Now, DL is displayed as only two terms, the first of which is the total sink, while the second is the total source. L sub lambda here represents the initial radiance at point X in direction R. Sigma E represents the volume extinction coefficient at the point, which is the sum of the absorption and scattering coefficients. Each of these coefficients has units of inverse length. We also define a single scattering albedo, which is the ratio of the volume scattering coefficient to the volume extinction coefficient. It describes the probability of an interaction between a photon and a potential scatterer as being a scattering interaction instead of an absorption. The single scattering albedo is low for wavelengths that are not scattered in the medium through which they propagate. For example, microwaves through clear, dry air. J represents the sources of radiation at that point toward the satellite. It consists of a source from thermal emissions and a source from scattering in a path toward the satellite. The thermal emissions are simply described as sigma A multiplied by the Planck radiance at point X. which is defined by the temperature at x. Note that Kirchhoff's law states that an object in thermodynamic equilibrium is an equally good emitter and absorber at the same wavelength. The coefficient related to emission will be no denoted as epsilon. If it were 1, the body would be a black body at the wavelength specified. Perfect black bodies do not exist, but planets and stars can often be approximated as black bodies at least for the purposes of describing them in this class. Note that objects can have epsilon that varies as a function of wavelength. If an object is a perfect emitter at some wavelength, it will also absorb all radiation incident upon it at the same wavelength. Here I have written that the volume absorption coefficient is equal in magnitude to the emissivity. What is strictly true is that absorptance, which is unitless, unlike the volume absorption coefficient, is equal to emissivity. For the purposes of this class, we will simply assume that sigma a is defined over a unit path length and that its magnitude equals the absorptance coefficient, which, like emissivity, cannot exceed 1. Therefore, we will subsequently use sigma a and epsilon interchangeably depending on whether we want to describe emission or absorption. The source associated with scattering looks a bit more complicated. It is a function of the radiance at point X moving in any direction R prime. The direction R, remember, is the path toward the satellite. Gamma is just a scattering phase function that incorporates the probability of radiation traveling in direction R prime getting scattered into the direction R. Then we integrate over 4 pi steradians the solid angle subtended by a sphere surrounding point X through all directions R prime, which is collectively denoted as uppercase omega prime. To summarize the past few slides, each of the two terms seen in the equation on the left have two terms within them. 
We can further expand on this form of Schwarzschild's equation, and we'll do so in the next module for various idealized radiative transfer scenarios. Before moving on, we should define a couple of very important concepts. The first is optical depth, which is also called optical thickness. I may use these two terms interchangeably throughout the course. I cannot stress one point enough. Optical depth is not actually a physical depth. It is a unitless variable that shows how much absorption and scattering of radiation at some specified wavelength occurs along a path. The mathematical definition is the integral of the volume extinction coefficient integrated over some path. We will use small delta to denote optical thickness. What is displayed here is the vertical path optical depth, which describes the optical depth along a perfectly vertical path. If we integrate this from zero to the top of the atmosphere, we compute the optical depth of the atmosphere. Another important concept is the direct transmittance, and sometimes I'll call this transmissivity. It exponentially decays as the vertical path optical depth increases. And it is also dependent upon the angle off the vertical that describes the direction of the path. We will see some drawings of this next to help you visualize this. That angle is described as theta, and we will denote mu as the cosine of theta. If theta is zero, meaning a vertical path, then the direct transmittance is just e to the negative vertical path optical depth, and you are left with the direct transmittance of the atmosphere which is what we discussed in previous modules. Finally note the general expression of path optical depth, where the path is denoted by s instead of the vertical coordinate z. Delta, as a function of s, along a path from s1 to s2, is just delta as a function of z through the layer transited by the path from s1 to s2, divided by mu. With all those words out of the way now, let's look at some pictures. In the next module, we'll be able to cover more related detail to optical depth along different paths. So you may find yourself coming back to this slide useful if you want to understand what we cover then. Let's return to our idealized atmosphere with a cloud. This, the ground has radiance L. For our path straight up, the angle theta is zero. Whatever the value of sigma e at various altitudes, its integral will always increase as radiation moves upward from the ground, since sigma e must be positive. The optical depth along this path is just the vertical path optical depth, or the integral of sigma e from the surface, zero, to the top of the atmosphere, z. Here we had denoted the ground as z prime equals zero, and the top of the atmosphere as z prime equals z z prime is our vertical coordinate. Then we integrate over z prime. We can also compute the optical depth of a layer that isn't the entire depth of the atmosphere. For example, suppose we want to know the optical depth of the cloud layer in the blue box. Then we simply integrate from the bottom of the cloud to the top of the cloud. The path that radiation travels along, however, doesn't have to be vertical. Suppose we want to know the optical depth along a path from the same point on the ground, we'll call it S1, to the satellite in this drawing, what we'll call S2. In this case, we have to consider the angle theta. The path along the solid line to the satellite is longer than the dashed line that points straight upward. So the optical depth, assuming that sigma e is horizontally homogeneous, will be larger along the solid line. In this case, we can say that the ground is point S1 and the satellite is point S2. The direct transmittance along this longer path will also be lower than the transmissivity along a vertical path. Of course, you can imagine that the optical depth might be very different dependent upon whether a cloud is present. It is also very sensitive to the concentration of atmospheric constituents such as water vapor, 
The various absorptivity of water vapor and other molecules at various wavelengths explains why some wavelength ranges are atmospheric windows on Earth and others are not. We will continue to build on, upon these concepts over the next few modules and begin to apply them as we start discussing particular remote sensing instruments.